Hello, everyone, and welcome to another edition of The Edric Show. I am your host, Edric Jerome. This is the place for intelligent conversation with interesting people. Go ahead and hit that subscribe button and ring that notification bell, and you'll get notified when I post content each and every week. Uh, I've been looking forward to uh, our guest today. Uh, my guest is documentary filmmaker Cheryl Fabio. Her latest film, A Rising Tide, shines a spotlight on the issue of homelessness in Oakland, California, and Alameda County, with an emphasis on the impact it has on women and children of color. Cheryl is also the executive director of the Sarah Webster Fabio Center for Social Justice, which aims to elevate and support Black voices in the areas of art, social justice, and community building. Cheryl, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me. My pleasure. Um, first question, um, what motivated you to make a film uh, specifically emphasizing the plight of homelessness with women and children? And uh, was there a specific story or experience that inspired you to make this film? You know, that's that's funny because when you said it, I always look for a experience, but the truth is it's like many experiences. So I live in East Oakland. I live in what they now call Deep East Oakland. And I'm saying the experience of homelessness is all around us. You know, I also um, kind of had my own experience with kind of trying to get myself reestablished. And thank God I was successful in it. But it reminds me of how close we are to this situation. And then that coupled with the fact that I had been hearing this statistic for years that Oakland has 50% of Alameda County's homelessness, which is, you know, that's suspect in itself. But then out of that 50%, um, 70% of it is Black folks. That was just a, a, tr a gut-eating, troubling kind of number. And it's a, 19, a 2019 number. And then we had the pandemic. And because of the infusion of money, that number went down some. However, with when you pull that money back, the number is rising again. So for me, there was just this real clear connection between homelessness and racism. Mm. And I very much wanted to address that. And then in a way, you know, I'm a little blunt about the things that I do. So, But in a way that puts it in your face. And then you get to decide whether or not you're going to participate in developing the will to do something about this. So, uh, you know, but in addition to all of that, I've got a young friend who's in the film who I've walked through maybe three or four different times when she slipped into homelessness. Mm -hmm. So it's just, it's, it's, it, it wasn't one thing. It was so many different things. And when you think about how hard it is to raise children, and what it must be like to have a kid bouncing in and out of that in such a capitalist, uh, consumer-oriented, when you don't even know where you're going to sleep at night. That's just, it's just a horrendous way to start, to be going to kindergarten, to, you know, to be in middle school. It's just, so I had to do something. And the thing I know how to do is to make a film, you know, um, so I used the skill I had to make the film I made. Um, one of the themes that uh, jumps right out at you as you're watching the film um, is the invisibility of women and children who are suffering through homelessness. We often think of homeless, uh, you know, veterans, men, you know, on the street. But um, there's a certain aspect of invisibility about this particular population. Can you speak to that and, and how your film addresses that issue? Absolutely. Uh, first of all, let me also be clear that this film, for me, is, uh, you know, my skill in putting it together, but it really brings in so many other people's talents, up to and including the personal stories of the folks who decided to participate. But that it, question of invisibility, is re it's still a daunting question. Whenever I present this film... There's always a conversation about the encampments, which are truly 
they're motivating because that's what we look at every day. But we it allows us to not even think about the children and the families who are sleeping in cars. They might be couch surfing. I was couch surfing for about a year and a half, which is at my age is kind of crazy, I think. But they're couch surfing. Sometimes they get shelter. They'll they'll move into shelters. But again, that's not a way to have um, to raise your children because you don't even know where they can go to school because the shelters shift from city to city. So this question of invisibility was the thing when I bumped into the concept that, for instance, now one in 10 kids in public school are homeless. Well, that we're not in an uproar about that number is crazy. But one of the reasons we aren't is because we don't tend to know that, right? And we don't know it because frankly, the families are they're participating in hiding it often because they feel like they'll get their kids taken. So now, you know, they don't have a home. They're having trouble with everything else. They certainly don't want to have their children taken. And m many of these people that we're talking about are people who are working. They're working these minimum wage jobs that we just keep our foot on, you know, folks necks in a in a community where it's a living wage is about $50 an hour, we pay people, well, now we're up to $15 an hour. We feel good about that. But $15 an hour has nothing to do with $50 at, an hour. So some of these families are, you know, uh, two house, you know, two parent households. Some of them are working multiple jobs. But that $15 an hour is not adding up to the $50 that it takes to float um, housing here in the Bay Area. Uh, but again, and, and some of the, the reason, so when I talk to specialists, because I do in this film, you know, they'll say, well, that's, that's not how child protective services work. You can't, you don't get your children taken because you're homeless. I don't know who's taking that chance. I, I don't think I'm volunteering to come out about being homeless, raising little kids, and trusting that the system isn't going to um, punish me for it, because the system is punishing you for absolutely everything else. So, um, you know, part of it, and, and where I really bumped into that concept, there's a doctor in the film, um, Christine Ma from Children's Hospital, who really talked a lot about the invisibility of the majority of homelessness. Like we know about a quarter of the homeless issue, three quarters of it is not um, available to us visually. Hmm. And that's when I said, okay, a film will make that more visible. So, so let's do that, you know, let's do that. Um, you mentioned the system and that actually led to my next question, because as I was writing notes while watching the film, one of the things that I noticed and it was just kind of an aha moment was uh, something I call the layering of systems that often trap people into homelessness, whether it's the educational system, the economic system, social services, the penal system, legal system, political system. They all kind of get layered on top of each other and it really traps people uh, to to try to get out of it. So. Can you speak to that layering of the systems and, and what are some of the challenges of just getting out of some of those oppressive systems? Well, frankly, I think when you pull back, the, the bigger statement, the broader statement is that our safety net is broken. Hmm. So if there is a, um, if there's something in place that is supposed to assist you when you slide out of being self-sufficient, right? You can almost count on the fact that that system is broken. And when I think about like the welfare system and, and all, you know, for maybe there used to be a war on poverty. That was the statement that was being made. But it, frankly, it was a war on poor people. And when we came out of the uh, social service system, and hit the 90s when uh, Bill Clinton decided that what we needed to do was to add a work component 
on to something that clearly, number one, people were being, um, they were being um, discriminated against in the workplace. So that's one reason you have, you have almost, almost, a, you know, I'm, I'll get pushed back, a caste system happening where people who are new to the country on this very bottom level, well, we've been here a while. So we might be um, in terms of the jobs that are available, one rung up. And one sometimes that's not helpful because those other folks might be able to get, um, they might be able to get assistance for small businesses where that's not happening for black folks. So, you know, this, this um, there is this layering, there's just an overt, and through time, anti-Black racism that happens, right? So that's infused on top of our broken safety net. We also substituted incarceration for a lot of the issues that are truly safety net issues. That was a really broken system for a really long time. And it's not that it's changed, but at least that we've halted that to some degree that mass incarceration where we went from like, I don't remember quite if it's 25% of the incarceral around the world to 200% of who's yeah. being incarcerated around the world. That's uh, that's this layering. So it's in the education that we are and we aren't see. California went from 50, um, I'm sorry, fourth in the country for their educational system we're down like we're the third from the bottom now. And all of this, I mean, there's so much history in it. And even that history is something that we often don't talk about. We don't know as a story because we've been told so many other kinds of stories. Anyway, in the film, I try to hit on a little bit of all of that just to show how the dots connect mm -hmm. and why this system, this safety net system, is so broken. So w one quick example of that is one of the things that happens, like this young lady that, that I know who was also part of the film, she's from Oakland and I've witnessed her become homeless and then get housed. And then maybe something will happen, like she's been waiting for a voucher, but that was in San Leandro. She had to become homeless again and then try and find a landlord in San Leandro. None of that makes any sense to me because it's just a street apart. She should have been able to, in my view, she should have been able to get a housing voucher that landed her any place that was quick and safe for her and her family. So these are just, it's such a complicated and frankly, to some degree, inhumane. And when I say that, I also understand when folks do get shelter, they're very grateful. But the process of getting there is just, it's horrific. It's really hard to watch up front. And most of us don't have to watch that. Exactly. Um, you highlight several advocacy groups uh, who are working hard to, to address this problem. Um, you know, one advocacy group can't do it alone. So maybe you could speak to the collective power of advocacy groups, uh, because it does seem to be that they need to partner in order to make some meaningful impact on reducing this challenge. Well, you know, if we didn't, frankly, if we didn't have advocacy groups, we'd be in bad shape because that's the voice that rises up. There's a certain boldness that it, that it requires. That voice, that advocacy voice rises up and pushes back on the things that we should all know need fixing. And, I, and, you know, one of the things that comes to mind is Moms for Housing. Mm -hmm. The media coverage of that was like, you, I even thought, wait, what's going on? I don't know. What's going on? What, you know, what are they doing? Well, those were all the wrong questions. And those are the questions a lot that, that our media set us up for. The real question would have been, wow, what are they pushing against? What's their strategy for success? I mean, there's a whole, and the majority of us never even go into that, you know, into that lane to figure out what are these folks saying? Is it like I see, well, I'm, I was about to go into something that's hot and political. That's fine. I will, yeah, I will say it because 
it's like there's a post on Facebook that keeps coming back to my, you know, my uh, chain. And it says something like, you know, how many uh, protests does it take for us to know it's wrong to bomb out all these children in Palestine? Like, that's something that the first time you hear about it, you know, uh oh, we've all seen this before. We do see this. And yet each time we see it, we act like we have to go on this learning curve. No, you don't kill children, period. You know, um, so advocates and, and those people, people who are engaged in advocacy, I don't know who we think they are, but they are individuals. Sometimes they do get paid because who gets to live in this world without any income? And they do partner. So if you're doing housing, you're looking for partners and allies around the, the community that also does that housing. But, you know, the truth is those are the few bold, courageous people. So they're always, it's always a David and Goliath kind of struggle. We have to open up our ears, open up our minds in a different way and not make their commitment to informing us such a challenge. I mean, that, that, and you know, my, my video practice is getting more and more into that, whether I'm making a big film, like I consider a rising tide to be a big film, or often I'm working with some of these nonprofits, making very short films that will allow them to get messages out and I kind of um, hope that, um, you know, some of my um, colleagues do the same. I mean, the one, that's one beautiful thing about this podcast is that podcasts are a way to put voice out there. As a consumer, I'm still kind of learning, you know, learning what do I listen to? Where do I find it? When do I have time to think about putting on headphones and paying attention? But I do think that that's going to, Help us in the long run keep this, uh, you know, keep the alarms going that it's not all good, you know. Absolutely. Uh, and I hope you subscribe to The Edric Show, plug for myself. Uh, let me ask you now, uh, because another really interesting aspect of the film that I really enjoyed was the the words of Oakland Poets Laureate uh, mm -hmm. Ayodele Nzinga. Uh, just a powerful aspect of the film. Tell me about her contribution and why her words are so impactful and meaningful. You're the first person that's asked that. And I have to say, when I start, I don't, I don't know. I didn't know Ayodele before this, but, and how a film comes to you, I don't know. It's, it, it just, you get moved and some things I get to shake and say, oh, I can't do that. But sometimes you can't shake it. And for me, those are the ones that get made. So, but from the very beginning, I had this idea that I needed her voice. She's the first thing we shot. But even before we did that, Ayadeli was very gracious. So I didn't know her. I reached out to her and she said, sure, I'll help. And that meant that we we would engage with each other over a period of about two or three months, uh, tweaking this. So she was very, she was like... And I said, you know, whatever this becomes, I wanted to open the film. And so she was really with me and, you know, no, it's a little bit more of this and a little bit more of that. And then when she did it, I thought it was uh, a perfect way. And I also decided that uh, it was about a four minute poem. So we started with it, mm -hmm. but then we wove it throughout the film because her voice is so strong that she always kind of pulls you back to, for me, pulls you back to the reality that we're living and jars you in a way that you are, she's very much in her in your face, both in her words and also in the delivery of it. Um, and then that set a tone. I also knew that I wanted uh, Tongo Eason Martin from San Francisco. I didn't know him either, but I did know that he had a different way. He had a, a, a more musical way. And I, part of it, part of what I'm describing to you is also 
I believe that people listen and learn differently. So there's something about this film where I'm trying to say, okay, if you're a, a musical learner and I've lived around musicians, I'm giving you a piece so that that sinks in for you. If you're a poet kind of person, we got that. We've also got some doctors in here. We got lots of folks to tell you the political will is basically up to us. So the same thing happened with him, except that Tongo's work is really uh, lyrical. So I said, dude, I don't know. I don't know how to choose. He said, choose anything you want. I don't know. I think you need to tell me. And so he chose that poem. And, you know, for me to make a film, I'm like in this footage, in these this audio. I might have to watch it 1,200 times, literally. Right. In the beginning, I had no idea what he was talking about. By the time it was, we had, we had, I had placed it. I was really on the wave with him, and um, and it's interesting to me how different people, different groups, will react to these different elements that are in the film. <laughs> um, let me ask you this question on a personal note because. Uh, you mentioned how many times you have to watch footage and you're in the footage every day and you're dealing with the subject every day. Uh, I'm sure it could be difficult and emotionally challenging uh, for a filmmaker like yourself to just be in this every day. Um, how are you able to keep filling your spiritual cup mm. uh, so that the production would continue and that you would be able to tell the story? Well, first of all, I work with a team. So I have an editor and I've worked with her forever. I used to work at KTOP, the city of Oakland's television channel, and she she's there. And so we worked together then, and we've worked on a couple of films. And I, I'm real particular about the people that I'm living, I mean, that I'm working with, because we need to be able to do that. And they need to do that for me, because out of all of them, I'm the one that's isolated, right, and going through this thing. Um. So there's that. But, you know, when you're doing something that's like it took about two and a half years for us to make this film. Life happens. Um, you know, I had a sister in hospice. I mean, all kinds of things are coming up. And so not only are you dealing with the tragedies of the subject in this film of the subjects and the stuff they're facing. One child died during our process. I mean, there's just like all this stuff coming at you. So the one thing that I know is going to ground me is that those people who are working with me, you know, they're, they're, they're kind. They're good to me. You know, like I can say, I can't deal with this right now. When this child passed, we went on hiatus for about six months. And then I was able to you know, face the story again and get back in it. And they were all right back in line again. So, you know, I I think there ought to be more, but the kind of artist life that I'm living, I'm thankful for that. There might not be more. And that's part of, do you decide to take on a project? And then once you do, how committed are you to seeing it through the end? And the one thing that I do know about myself uh I'm determined once I commit. Like I'm not so, I'm not so good before that commitment, but once I've committed, I'm going to see it through. Um shifting gears now a little bit, um tell me about the Sarah Webster Fabio Center for Social Justice. Uh I know it's uh, named after your your mom who did so much uh great work in the area of social justice. Uh tell me about the center and uh, uh how people can maybe get more information about it. Thank you. Um, so we've had this nonprofit for about 20 years. And we started, um, I was living in Emeryville at the time, and it started as a way we wanted to build a media center for the kids in Emeryville, those kids on the blue collar side of Emeryville before it went through this boom. That's how we started this. And then the economy tanked in, 20, in 2008 and life happened and all of that. I went away from it. When I came back to it, we needed to change the name. And so my board decided they wanted to change it 
to uh, the Sarah Webster Fabio Center for Social Justice in honor of my mother, which is kind of, it's a long name. And I kept saying, really? I got to run around saying all of that all of the time. They said, yes. And it was kind of a good lesson for me because I tend to shy away from a lot of stuff, but I'm running around talking about my mother's center, right? And also it's an aspirational center. So the center is actually this room that I'm sitting in right now, but we haven't given up. We're pushing, we're growing, we're doing all the things we need to do. And we do, well, part of it is deciding that Black folks in Oakland need institutions. So we're we're in process, even if it's an aspirational institution, we're building an institution here, not just an organization, but an institution. So that's kind of... Uh, but also in this, so we've been at it at least 20 years, but in the process of that, as I kind of refined uh, attention to the things that I do, that I do well, I feel, that feed me, we, we kind of went from a general thing into uh, that part of the center is the producer of these documentaries that we've been doing. And occasionally we get to do public programming. The other thing that we do is we're a fiscal sponsor for other smaller groups that aren't ready to be a 501c3 yet, but they need a 501c3 to get on their feet. So we do a lot of that. Um, and it has the flexibility. So the film I made before this one was about blues in, in West Oakland, blues and music in West Oakland. This time it's about homelessness. The nice thing for me is that it really gets to, I get to follow whatever it is that's moving me in a way where I don't know where else, I don't know where else I'd have that luxury. Even if I was doing for profit work, I wouldn't have that luxury necessarily. So I'm I'm grateful to the fact that um, even though I'm hard-headed, I did listen to my board. We did become this center, and it's given a lot of us a lot of flexibility. Uh, in our remaining moments, I do want to ask you a, a filmmaking question because I, I get the opportunity to talk to a lot of filmmakers and directors and producers uh, with this show. And one of the questions I always ask them um, is, what is your experience, take, view of the film festival circuit uh, I tend to ask a lot of folks about that. Uh, and just in general, your experience with not just the filmmaking circuit, but distribution. Um, oh. Any tips or any pointers or any ahas? Uh, you're a veteran filmmaker, and and I, I, I kind of get the same answers, but I'm always curious how filmmakers view that whole situation. Well, first of all, uh, so I am veteran. I mean, I started in 76, and I've gone through waves and waves and waves. Even when I made a film in 2017, this distribution land, land uh, scape was different than it is today. So one thing about being a filmmaker is that you can never anticipate what's coming down the pike. Uh, and and our, our technology is always in. So you really have to be someone, I think, who's willing to learn new stuff. So, so that's one thing. Distribution is really d disturbing to me right now because there are like streaming services are the place that to go now but it's also that the that notion of gatekeepers it's heavier on you when the way that you get to have an audience is through streaming with small distributors they had catalogs they had a market that they would kind of target to and i could walk into a distributor and say, hey, I have this film, you want to look at it, da 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 and make a deal at whatever level of filmmaking I was at. Hmm. Uh, but that's not true now. And so with this film so far, I've had to kind of dog and pony it around. Uh, I am looking for a distributor. I'm not real hopeful. And I'm thinking, well, you know, maybe you're going to have to do one of those pay for um, streaming services. But it's a completely different terrain than it was maybe four or five years ago and certainly way different than it was like 20 or 30 years ago. I thank you for sharing your perspective. And uh, uh, like I said, I, I get to talk to filmmakers and uh, I just, it's fascinating the different experiences people have with films, but you know, it's, 
it's a necessary, I guess, component of it in order for people to see it. So thank you for sharing your perspective. And I, I knew you'd shed some very uh, knowledgeable insights given your, your history of filmmaking over the years. Um, my last question for you is uh, if people want more information about you or the film or the Sarah Webster Fabio Center for Social Justice, uh, where can they go? Well, for the film, we have a website. It's arisingtidemovie.com. And you can reach me through that and all. But the rest of it, I think, like Sarah Webster Fabio uh, Center for Social Justice, you can Google that. All of it leads right back to me. And so uh, I'm not I'm not hard to reach. And also um, let us know if you want to do a screening. Let us know if you you know, want to know where it's showing. We do try and keep our postings up to date. Excellent. Excellent. Well, Cheryl, I know you're very busy. I want to thank you so much for taking the time to come on the Edric Show. I really appreciated our conversation. And thank you for shedding light on this problem that, uh, you know, really needs a lot more attention. So thank you for the film. Thank you, Edric. I appreciate being here. You're very welcome. This has been another edition of the Edric Show. My guest has been Cheryl Fabio. Her latest film, A Rising Tide, shines a spotlight on the issue of homelessness in Oakland and in Alameda County with an emphasis on the impact it has on women and children of color. Again, this is the place for intelligent conversation with interesting people. Go ahead and hit that subscribe button and ring that notification bell, and you'll get notified when I post content each and every week. I want to thank you for tuning in, and I will catch you on the next episode.